Welcome to the Megacast. I'm Tyler Keefe. I'm in the studios of our flagship stations, 89.3 Lakes FM and Civic Center TV on Comcast Channel 15 and AT&T Channel 99. We can also find us in the Birmingham Bloomfield area on Birmingham Area Municipal Access and on City Cable 15 of Southfield. Join us live on Channel 10 in Waterford every day on the media network of Waterford and live to tape on Channel 10 in Orion Township and Lake Orion on Orion Neighborhood Television or ONTV. You can also find us on the radio in the Birmingham, Bloomfield, and Troy areas on 88.1, the BIF, a service of the Bloomfield Hills School District. And find us online on our Facebook pages at Civic Center TV 15 and at Lakes FM on our website, civiccentertv.com. And beginning at 11 o'clock for the Michigan Megacast on My Michigan TV or My My at MyMyTV.com, where you can also learn more about downloading their free My My TV apps for your smartphone and smart TVs. All that information is on our website, civiccentertv.com slash megacast. We can also find all of our full programs on demand as well as each individual interview. Then let's head over to our coronavirus page at civiccentertv.com slash coronavirus, where we have links to the most up-to-date information on COVID-19 from the Centers for Disease Control, the Michigan Department of Health and Human Resources, so Health and Human Services, and the Oakland County Health Division for reliable expert resources on COVID-19 information. So that you can stay up to date on everything you need to know about the spread of the covid precautionary tactics such as masking and uh, distancing as well as vaccinations and booster shots in your local area. Also on our coronavirus page at civiccentertv.com slash coronavirus, we feature articles from journalistic outlets throughout the state of Michigan in order to keep you updated on COVID-19 and other stories making headlines across the Great Lakes state. Our top story today from the Detroit News, it's opening day in downtown Detroit for the Detroit Tigers. It's early, it's cold, but opening day has arrived and so have the fans. Opening day in Detroit dawned with overcast skies and the threat of rain, but the day held the promise of a near typical start to a baseball season after two years of pandemic related changes and then a lockout during this offseason that at times looked like it would be a significant pushback to the start of the regular season. Instead, after a week's delay, baseball is back. Vendors were out early preparing for crowds expected hours before today's 105 p.m. first pitch. Temperatures were just about 40 degrees, not quite baseball weather exactly, but pretty much the norm for Detroit opening days in early April. In the distance, music is playing as generators run and smoke is coming from grills being fired up. Traffic on Woodward at the time is light. At 8.30 a.m., people are getting the grill going. That includes Casey Poirier of Clyde, Michigan. Tailgating at the Tigers' first game is a tradition for him and his family, and so is wearing the suit festoon with the baseball team's logos. He said his sister made it for him, and he's worn it every opening day since he can remember. Before 8.30 p.m., he was cutting up green peppers on a makeshift counter uh, on a pickup truck bed gate to grill alongside some brats and Kilbasa. Nearby, the group he was with were lounging in chairs under a collapsible canopy. Poirier said there were heaters running under the tent to take the chill off. Quote, this is what it's all about, he said, and hopefully we'll get a Tigers win, too. At 7.30, it was the early birds making their way out to downtown Detroit with baseball mitts in hand. Jacob Berger and Werner Wisniewski, both 19 and from Allen Park, milled about the main entrance of Comerica Park, waiting to get in early and perhaps score a few autographs. Quote, for me, this is the start of of summer and the start of baseball in Detroit, was Newski said. He said this is the first time he's come down to the ballpark for opening day. Berger is an old hand, uh, this being the second year he's had tickets to the season's first game of the year at the stadium located on Woodward. Quote, and I come to just about every Tigers home game, Berger also said. Both said they're looking forward to a season and think to the season and think that the team has a shot at making the playoffs this year. Quote, if Riley Green and Spencer Torkelson step up, we'll be good, was Newski said. Also making headlines from the Detroit News on our website at civiccentertv.com slash coronavirus. More communities speaking out against the Great Lakes Water Authority as uh, billing issues amount. Several Macomb County communities voted this week to withhold the Highland Park portion of their city water bills from the Great Lakes Water Authority. Macomb Township, St. Clair Shores, and Sterling Heights joined the communities across southeast Michigan, pushing back at having to contribute toward a $54 million tab the Water Authority said Highland Park owes dating all the way back to 2012. Macomb Township said it would withhold, quote, water and sewer costs attributable to Highland Park's non-payment and place those funds in escrow while a just settlement of this matter is pursued, and closed quote, according to a resolution from the township. 
The payments will cease at the start of the fiscal year 2023, which begins on July 21st of this year. Sterling Heights Mayor Michael Taylor urged Governor Whitmer to mediate a settlement, saying, quote, she's passing the buck, but the buck stops with her. The state created this problem, and closed quote. After a century of water independence, the state shut down Highland Park's water plant in November of 2012 due to issues with cloudy water. Highland Park was hooked up to the Great Lakes Water Authority on, quote, emergency, in close quote, basis, and remains so a decade later. Those costs have been passed on to other communities served by the Water Authority, and in the last decade, Macomb County communities have contributed $13.5 million toward the area ridge. If those payments continued uh, just another year, that would jump to $15 million. To date, Macomb Township has paid $1.43 million and is slated to contribute nearly $178,000 in fiscal year 2023. Macomb Township has 92,000 residents according to the 2020 U.S census. To date, St. Clair Shores population is 59,000 uh, 59, has paid about $1.5 million since 2012 and would pay another $165,000 in fiscal year 2023. Mayor Kip Walby of St. Clair Shores says he was at a recent gathering with about 15 people. Three of them asked about Highland Park. He said, quote, it's upsetting to them, Walby said. The bills are already high, and closed quote. Whether it's just a judge or the state, Mayor Walby said, quote, we need someone that's a third party to mediate the situation and come to some sort of resolution. That's what I haven't seen, and closed quote. John Karen, city councilman and mayor pro tem of St. Clair Shores, said the issue drew public attention when the Great Lakes Water Authority sent letters to each community listing their contribution to the debt so far and how much they would contribute in fiscal year 2023. Quote, to see what each community is paying to cover what Highland Park is not paying really brings the issue to the forefront, Karen said, continuing on saying, quote, it's caused communities to take action, and closed quote. Karen believes the matter will end with, quote, a court, a court injunction requiring Highland Park to pay part of what they owe, in closed quote, continuing on saying just not paying is not acceptable, in closed quote. Non-payment will beget non-payment, leaders said, quote, the payments will stop, said Taylor of Sterling Heights, whose community has paid about $2.7 million to the Highland Park debt with about $345 million, uh, sorry, $345,000 on deck for fiscal year 2023. Taylor predicted, quote, dozens of communities would pass similar resolutions to withhold the Highland Park related funds. Quote, ultimately, this is going to affect us, uh, but it will apply pressure to the Great Lakes Water Authority to get the state involved, and close quote. Highland Park sees the matter differently. It's, it sees its decades-long relationship with the Water Authority as a marriage neither side wanted. It says it has been overcharged for water and tried in the court of public opinion, even after winning in the court of law. Highland Park cites a 2021 Wayne County Circuit Court ruling that subsumed any debt that's under a $1 million judgment over Detroit. In an April 1st letter to the Great Lakes Water Authority leadership, Highland Park Water Director Damon Garrett wrote that, quote, Highland Park is dismayed by Gliwa's unregulated authoritarian strategy to characterize it as the scapegoat to cover its justification for rate increases to support their bloated organization, in closed quote. Garrett continued on saying, quote, the city is disgusted by the impacts of the Great White Lakes Water Authority's frivolous lawsuits, blatant disregard for contracts, and the, most, and the utmost disrespect that they have for their own settlement agreements, and close quote. The Great Lakes Water Authority, meanwhile, said Highland Park has paid just 1% of its water bills and 50% of its sewer bills since 2012, but nothing at all since April of last year. Highland Park says the recent non-payments are invoices for past overages. Litigation is ongoing. Communities have grown restless about paying bills for service that they don't use. Macomb County Supervisor, sorry, Macomb Township Supervisor Frank Viviano penned a March 23rd letter to Governor Whitmer urging her involvement. Quote, by any measure, this is an unfair burden to, the pla to place on the residents of Macomb Township, the mayor wrote. Uh, this, the, sorry, the supervisor wrote, quote, the state of Michigan bears some responsibility for circumstances which led to this dispute, Supervisor Viviano wrote. He added, quote, a higher authority has the ability to step in and become a part of the solution. So far, the governor has been reluctant to do so. 
in multiple statements to the Detroit News on the Highland Park Lewa debt issue. The governor's office has, quote, encouraged and close quote the sides to work things out, but has not indicated a willingness to get involved further or cover the area ridge, as some communities are asking. Quote, the likely result of the path we are on will be costly and time consuming litigation, the supervisor Viviano wrote to the governor. At a March 30th press conference, Viviano joined the leaders of Shelby Township, St. Clair Shores, and Sterling Heights in announcing plans to withhold funds. Macomb County Executive Mark Hackle called the press conference along with Macomb County Public Works Commissioner Candace Miller. Quote, enough is enough, said, uh, said Hackle. Macomb County communities have joined their counterparts in Downriver and Western Wayne County to withhold funds. Oakland County shares its neighbors' frustration but has been unwilling to withhold funds, believing this would starve the system of vital resources. Oakland County Water Resources Commissioner Jim Nash told the Detroit News, quote, It's not like we can take the water back from Highland Park. It just means there's less money to spend on operations and maintenance and capital projects, and closed quote. Great Lakes Water Authority interim CEO Suzanne Coffey has said she does not see the withholding scheme as a mutiny, but as a way of raising awareness and urging state involvement. Quote, I wish it didn't have to be quite so controversial, Co uh, Coffey said in an appearance Sunday on WDIV or Local 4's Flashpoint. Quote, but the reality is raising awareness is going to help us get the problem solved. And close quote. That full article from the Detroit News on our website, civiccentertv.com slash coronavirus. Lastly, making headlines over there from the Detroit Free Press, Tim Robinson, the star of Detroiters, is shooting a TV pilot for HBO Max right here in Oakland County in Ferndale. Tim Robinson of Detroiters is again showing his home, his home area loyalty by bringing his latest project in suburban Detroit later on this week. Some Ferndale residents were notified by letters of plans to shoot scenes at home in their neighborhood on Thursday Friday and Monday, April 7th, 8th, and 11th, for a TV pilot called Computer School. Written and executive produced by Robinson and Zach Kanan, two of the co-creators of Detroiters, the potential HBO Max series is about a recent high school graduate and his uncle, played by Tim Robinson, who are classmates in a computer class in a Motor City suburb. Word spread on Thursday that a large shoot was happening near Ferndale's Geary Park. The latter explaining the film of filming a location manager for quote unquote computer school wrote that no disruptions were anticipated to the daily routine routines of those living in the neighborhood quote our goal is to make this a positive experience for everyone involved the letter said this is the second tv project that robinson who grew up in clarkston has done since detroiters was canceled by comedy central after its second season back in 2018. robinson has a critically acclaimed hit in 2019 with i think you should leave a comedy sketch series for netflix that he also co-created with kanan its second season arrived in 2021. although detroiters had a short run on cable tv it's continued to draw viewers through streaming set in detroit and filmed in and around the city it chronicled the antic efforts of two best friends played by robinson and co creator Sam Richardson, real life pals who originally met through Detroit's improv comedy scene to keep their small advertising agency afloat. Among its best known fans is Questlove, drummer for The Roots and Oscar winning filmmaker for Summer of Soul, who has made his hopes for a Detroiters revival clear on Twitter. Questlove tweeted in March saying, quote, I'm willing the return of Detroiters back on the air. That full article from the Detroit Free Press, as well as our other articles making headlines today on our website, civiccentertv.com slash coronavirus, as well as links to accurate, up-to-date information from experts on COVID-19 from the CDC, the MDHHS, and the Oakland County Health Division. We have a great program today on this Friday edition of the Oakland County Megacast. Coming up next, we will speak with Dr. Russell Faust from the Oakland County Health Division about the ongoing pandemic. And then at 1040, we'll be joined by West Bloomfield Township Supervisor Steve Kaplan. That's all up next. This is the Oakland County Megacast. If you are struggling to afford your internet bills during the pandemic, there's a temporary government program that may be able to help. It's called the Emergency Broadband Benefit, and it provides up to a $50 monthly discount on your broadband bill to qualifying households. Find more information about the program, including if you qualify and how to enroll at FCC.gov slash broadband benefit or call toll free at 833-511-0311. A public service announcement from 89.3. Lakes FM. Whether you're the city, the county, or the Huron River Watershed Council, we work together to protect water resources for everyone. Most of the pollution entering our rivers is carried by rainwater that runs off roads, parking lots, and rooftops. A rain garden helps catch stormwater runoff. Rain gardens and their plants 
help dirty runoff soak into the ground. You can do your part to help keep our water clean. Learn about rain gardens and native plants. So consider a rain garden in your home landscaping. Catch the runoff with a rain garden. There's one water and it's ours to protect. I couldn't breathe at all. There was lots of talk about putting me on a ventilator. I thought I was gonna die. I was 39 weeks pregnant and had a scheduled C-section. During that time, I got COVID and was hospitalized for a month. I had a blood clot in my lungs. It caused me to go into right-sided heart failure. I was really scared. I kept texting my husband and my mom, telling them how scared I was, and I was worried that he was gonna grow up without a mom. And then I was worried if when I did get home, that he wouldn't know who I was. You know, being 27 and a mom and a wife and having that all almost taken away from me. It's scary. And if a vaccine can prevent that from happening, why not? Get your vaccine. I don't want this to happen to anybody else. A message from the staff of Michigan's Crime Victim Compensation Program. Anyone can be a victim of crime. And suffer lasting trauma, physically, emotionally, and financially. But you are not alone. If you're struggling financially due to a crime, we're here for you. Find out if you qualify for crime victim compensation. Call 877-251-7373 or visit michigan.gov slash crime victim. A message from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services, Division of Victim Services. Welcome back to the Oakland County Megacast. I'm Tyler Keefe. To learn more about the program at civiccentertv.com slash megacast, where you'll also find information on all of our partnering stations from community television and radio outlets all throughout the Oakland County area, civiccentertv.com slash megacast. Joining us now is the Chief Medical Officer at the Oakland County Health Division, Dr. Russell Faust, back with us once again on the Oakland County Megacast. Dr. Faust, thank you for being here. Good to see you again, Tyler. Thanks for inviting. Yeah, good to see you as well. So the BA2 variant of COVID-19, it seems to be becoming more dominant in the U.S. as of past as of past Wednesday. Michigan reported 3,215 new cases of COVID and 70 virus-related deaths on Wednesday. It's an average of about 643 cases over the past five days. At this moment in time, definitely less drastic of a COVID-19 situation than the last time we spoke. But where does Michigan, and particularly Oakland County, stand on the COVID-19 front at this moment in time? Well, I think overall, um, we still have some pretty good news. Um, this week, CDC reports that we are at 71 cases per 100,000 of population, which still keeps us in the low transmission category. And I think, you know, that that's where we want to remain. Um, we are seeing just a, a mild up creek versus last week. But overall, we've been, you know, in the downtrend for, for a couple months now. And overall, I think this is all good news. I mean, I think the, the thing that gives me great hope is that unlike what had been seen in Europe, say Denmark, specifically when this BA2 Omicron variant arrived there, they went into another whole, huge surge, just an enormous surge. Um, and, and we haven't been seeing that here. You know, Omicron BA2 has been present here in Oakland County now for um, nearly three months. And the fact is, it's just kind of creeping up in terms of its takeover. It's about 70 to 75% of all the cases right now in Oakland and across state. But the fact is, we're, we're not seeing that surge. And I speculate that the reason is, most of us have already had COVID or we are fully vaccinated for COVID. And so our level of immunity in the community is very high. And I think um, what we're seeing is, um, what we're seeing is, whereas people are still transmitting at a low level, um, people are not really getting that ill. Now, having said that, um, this is not yet endemic. That is, it's not like influenza, which is just everywhere. Um, you know, COVID is still killing people. People are still dying at about 10 times the rate they do for the other respiratory viruses, including influenza or flu. So this is still 
a dangerous virus and we still need to take precautions you know a mask when you're out in in public um and you know i'm hopeful now i'm i'm very optimistic now that we're headed into warm weather that we can take a lot of our meetings outdoors we can open the windows and ventilate our offices when we do have meetings you know i think overall we're in a very good place right now um, in michigan in the country and especially in oakland county so we uh, previously, the last time we had you on, we were in the middle of a COVID-19 surge with the Omicron variant. At that time, models, uh, statistical models from the medical community were showing an expectation that that surge was going to at some point taper off and then dramatically reduce. That model has seemed to have come to fruition at this moment in time. Where are, the mo where are those statistical models at now for our our near future, and I, and I would presume they probably don't go as far as next fall, but I would also imagine that next fall, as the weather starts to get cooler, that would be the next time, potentially, if we don't reach an endemic stage by that point, which is not all too far away uh, temporally, that that could be the next choke point of this pandemic where surging, surging cases could become a problem. Where do the models show us going with COVID-19 at this point? I think the good news is that we are, we have been a surprise to the models. You know, most of the models are based on what we see um, kind of headed this way. You know, we're able to predict, we're able to model things based on what happens say in Europe or in Australia or South America or the UK um, specifically. And we're not seeing that. So I think um, we are now in a surprise phase and that the models predicted that when Omicron BA2 hit here, that we would be surging again, and we're just not. So again, I'm cautiously optimistic in that, um, you know, as we move through the summer months, we'll continue to at least stabilize, plateau, if not continue a downtrend. Um, I am concerned for next fall because human nature is, you know, we see some good signs like this and uh, everybody thinks now we're out of this pandemic, start to celebrate, not wear a mask, not maintain distance, not wash our hands, not take those usual, you know, mitigating uh, actions. And um, we may be in trouble again when school comes back in next fall. But I do want to emphasize, you know, we've had little minor blips, you know, we hear at Oakland County are one of the um, one of the many kind of nodes on the network where our laboratory is sampling um, wastewater in the community. Wastewater is just a euphemism for sewage. And twice a week now, we're sampling at 17 individual sites. And um, during the time when um, you know, after a lot of the schools, colleges had gone on break and then returned. Folks had traveled, had let down their guard, not worn masks when they were in crowds. Um, we had little blips in some of those um, dormitory populations, for example, but we just didn't see that continued. We didn't see the transmission. And again, most of us have either had COVID or been fully vaccinated or both. And I think, I think we're in a very good place right now. We're joined by Dr. That was a long Russell. ramble. I no, don't know whether I answered your, your question, Tyler. No, you did. Uh, we're joined by Dr. Russell Faust, the Chief uh, Medical Officer at the Oakland County Health Division. Joining us on the Oakland County Megacast, you can learn more information and keep up to date on COVID-19 from the, from the Oakland County Health Division by visiting civiccentertv.com slash coronavirus and click, clicking on our Oakland County link, which will take you directly to their COVID-19 specific webpage where you can learn more information about COVID-19 in Oakland County, as well as vaccinations and booster shots should you still be in the need of either at this moment in time. So Dr. Faust, um, what are some of the other lessons that the medical community has learned from managing this crisis for these past two years plus, and how does that help to inform other minor medical crises that may pop up in the years to come or the next great crisis like a COVID-19 situation that we could have in the future? Thank you, I, I love that question, Tyler. Um, you know, we've learned quite a bit we've learned to be prepared. You know, the last uh, government regime basically had um, dropped the ball and um, many of our warehouses that should be stocked with masks, gowns, gloves, et cetera, just weren't. 
and we're well stocked now, you know, nationally. Um, the other thing is right now, all of the local health departments are pretty well oiled machines then now that they've been doing this for two years with regard to testing and vaccinating the outreach clinics uh you know they're just so good at it now that i think we're well prepared for the next um epidemic or pandemic as long as we um you know we maintain our readiness i think we're we're certainly in a better position now and i i do want to emphasize that um I'm grateful that the CDC at the federal level and state level has established this national network of collaborative labs and, and water resource commissions and um, public health teams to monitor wastewater. And already we're beginning to apply that to other viruses and other emerging pathogens that you know we're just seeing kind of pop up now. We're beginning to apply these methods to, to keep the, the public safe. So I think I think a lot of good has come out of this. So let's go into more detail on the wastewater testing. How does that uh, testing then inform the next actions that are being taken by a health, a health department, whether it be Oakland County, surrounding areas, or in a partnership between tri-county areas or at a state or regional level? Sure. Well, the, the big benefit with regard to SARS-CoV-2 that causes COVID-19, the big benefit is that when we, we, as we become infected, actually excrete in our stool, in our wastewater, um, we actually excrete viruses or particles of the virus that are detectable through testing in the wastewater prior to actually becoming clinically infected, that is manifesting the infection symptoms and prior to us um, shedding virus, you know, respiratory virus droplets. So the beauty there is that when we see that, that upsurge in virus and wastewater, we know that clinical cases are beginning to develop. And what we've been doing is monitoring wastewater in various uh, congregate living facilities, dormitories, for example, and going in, testing everybody, finding the two or three people that are infected early and isolating them before they're able to transmit to everybody else and, and stopping an outbreak. So I think that's the model moving forward. Um, not all viruses have that kind of uh, life cycle or presentation. But for those that do, the other coronaviruses and many other viruses, um, that's a good model. And I think the, the other value is that, as you point out, those collaborative teams, those partnerships moving forward um, have streamlined this process. And again, we are applying this to, uh, to other hepatitis viruses, other coronaviruses, rather respiratory viruses, and some of the other emerging pathogens. And be happy to talk about that sometime, but that would take more than we have today. We're joined by Dr. Russell Fauci, Chief Medical Director over at the Oakland County Health Division, joining us on the Oakland County Megacast. More information on our website, civiccentertv.com slash coronavirus. You click on the Oakland County link. It'll take you to the Oakland County Health Division's COVID-19 webpage so you can learn more information about what they're doing to prevent the spread of COVID-19, to combat COVID-19 cases that are in Oakland County, as well as information on where you can get vaccinated or get your booster shot locally in the Oakland County area. civiccentertv.com slash coronavirus right there at the top of the page, CDC, MDHHS, Oakland County is the third to the right uh, at the top of that page. Dr. Faust, as we've seen more variants pop up, it seems like the last few have been, the last couple variants, Omicron and even Delta, have been more highly transmissible, not necessarily uh, pro producing stronger symptoms or a greater chance of uh, of negative, sim of, not negative sim symptoms, that's probably more severe disease. Worse. More severe yeah. disease. Yeah. yeah uh, has kind of been the trend. It's, it was what was seen more with Omicron. It's what's been seen with the BA2 subvariant of Omicron. As you and, other, and, others, and others on the scientific side of things uh, in battling this pandemic are looking at COVID 19 as it continues to vary uh, over time, is that kind of what, what's being imagined as these future variants are going to continue to be? They're going to be more easily spread, but maybe not be as deadly until we reach a point where we have seasonal uprisings of COVID-19 cases, but they're not at a point where they are at pandemic proportions that are overwhelming hospitals. 
I, I think that's a pretty insightful question, Tyler. Um, so the variants, every active infection is basically a factory of additional mutations. This is a mutating RNA virus. So every active infection produces more variants. The only variants that really um, survive or catch on and are transmitted are those variants that are more easily transmitted than the existing variant that's kind of spread through the population. So in order for a variant to really take over, it you really can only do so by being more easily transmitted. Um, stickier, stick to the receptors a little bit better. There are many, you know, possible uh, mechanisms to be more transmissible. But yeah, I think moving forward, that's what we can expect. And I think as, um, as across our communities, the level of immunity um, is maintained or increased either through continued vaccination as we do for influenza or through um, kind of um, natural or native immunity by being previously infected. I think moving forward, what we'll see is, is more um, easily transmitted variants, but less severe disease. And in fact, we, we see that right now. You know, we're seeing transmission in the community, the low, you know, we're still in low level transmission, but we still see cases. But the difference is they're not filling our hospitals as they did, you know, a year ago. They're just not filling our hospitals. And when I, I you know, this is the number I check on a daily basis because this really gives us an insight into um, how well we're doing in the community is how many cases are in our hospitals. And it's extremely low, it's very reassuring. So, but I think you're, you're correct. That's what we can expect. And so Dr. Faust, earlier on, you mentioned that we're not at the point where we're, where COVID-19 is endemic. We are at a very low spread of COVID-19 com in comparison to the past. The community spread isn't as severe as it has been. It continues to trend further toward going down. And then maybe this is a more complicated question than simply at a, at a county level, and, and I know it is because it's going to be, because this is a, a pandemic; it's worldwide. Where is that point where the scientific community, where the medical community, would be able to properly declare something like COVID nineteen to be reaching an endemic viral spread? Yeah, that that is a uh, a very complicated question, or the answer is very complicated, um, and I think there's there's a fair amount of disagreement among the medical and scientific community for for what that that trigger is, what that threshold is. You know, what do we need to reach in terms of um, level of transmission? But I think really um, a lot of it has to do with the um, the lethality of this virus. And so, um, you know, the World Health Organization is still saying that we're still a way off from COVID-19 being endemic, you know, but really the pandemic is not only the, the global aspect of this, many countries involved, but also the, the rapid growth of transmission and infection. Um, you know, we, we're really kind of coming out of that pandemic phase. And I think if we continue to be plateaued or um, kind of downtrending as we hit next fall, um, I think we'll, you know, I think it will be reasonable to consider ourselves out of an emergency or pandemic kind of phase. Perhaps not technically endemic, according to all the medical scientists, but I think we'll, uh, I think that would be, that would be a great milestone. Um, yeah, I think beyond that, I think we'll have little epidemics of geographic clusters of infections and outbreaks. But um, yeah, I think we can all look forward to that time. Dr. Faust, before we let you go, anything else at this time that would be important for people in Oakland County to be uh, keeping front of mind on the COVID-19 front or other things medically in the community? Yeah, two things. Um, and thanks for asking. Really, um, if you haven't gotten your flu shot, get your flu shot. If you are co-infected with SARS-CoV-2, COVID-19, and influenza, your mortality risk goes up more than six times being infected by either one alone. You don't wanna be infected with both. So get your flu shot. And the second thing is make sure that you're optimally, maximally vaccinated against COVID-19. Um, you know, we're out to a second booster now for 
um, for eligible populations, but you know, check the website, see where you are, get your second you know, vaccination, get your booster if you qualify, get your second booster if you qualify, and um, stay healthy. Dr. Faust, thank you, for, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Tyler. Appreciate it. More information on our website, civiccentertv.com slash coronavirus. Click on the Oakland County link. That will take you directly to their COVID-19 specific webpage, or you can go to oakgov.com and navigate to their health department page. We're going to take a break here on the Oakland County Megacast. On the other side, we'll head over to West Bloomfield Township, where they have their household hazardous waste event this weekend for West Bloomfield, Kegel Harbor, Sylvan Lake, and Orchard Lake residents. We'll be joined by Steve Kaplan, the West Bloomfield Township Supervisor, to talk about that and more programs and events happening happening in West Bloomfield. That's coming up next. You're watching the Oakland County Megacast. If you are struggling to afford your internet bills during the pandemic, there's a temporary government program that may be able to help. It's called the Emergency Broadband Benefit, and it provides up to a $50 monthly discount on your broadband bill to qualifying households. Find more information about the program, including if you qualify and how to enroll at FCC.gov slash broadband benefit or call toll free at 833-511-0311. A public service announcement from 89.3. Lakes FM. You see certain things get reincarnated in your children. My daughter is very much inspired by my wife's artistic pursuits. So my daughter started making necklaces. She makes what we call affirmation fashion. I tell her every day that your black is beautiful. Your black is beautiful. Your black is beautiful. And if there's anything better than being beautiful, it's being smart. If there's anything better than being smart, it's being kind. And reaffirming that every day is our method of making sure her chin never drops. My dad wasn't around. And I remember riding a bike and falling off and cutting myself. And me never just wanting to get back on it. People ask, how your children learn how to ride a bike? And you did. I didn't teach them. I just created an environment where they taught themselves. And all I had to do was be there. Whether you're the city, the county, or the Huron River Watershed Council. As partners working together to protect our water resources, we agree. Pet waste is the source of harmful bacteria in the Huron River. When it's left on the ground, it can wash into the storm drain. These lead directly to our streams. No filters, no treatment. Here's one thing we know that can help keep our water clean. Pick up pet waste and trash it. Pick up pet waste and trash it. So pick up pet waste and trash it. There's one water, and it's ours to protect. Who is struggling right now? I am. My son is. Many are struggling with anxiety, depression, and substance use. Before it becomes a crisis, reach out to MyCal, the Michigan Crisis and Access Line for free confidential support 24-7. Available in the Upper Peninsula in Oakland County. Just call or text 1-844-44-MYCAL or chat online at michigan.gov slash mycal. A message from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. Motorcyclists are hard to see. To keep everyone safer, it's important to always look for them and know where most crashes occur. 84% of motorcycle and vehicle crashes happen on streets, not highways. And most crashes with motorcyclists occur when vehicle drivers are turning left. So before turning, especially to the left. Make sure you look for motorcyclists. Then look again. It could save a life. To Sofia and Gabriel, even though these old knees can't follow on your adventure to the forest today, these flowers represent my love. These stitches and threads join us together. And wherever you see a flower, a bird, a beautiful tree, know that my love is with you. Make the forest part of your story at a park near you. Find one at discovertheforest.org. the West Bloomfield Township Supervisor Steve Kaplan back with us once again on the Oakland County Megacast. Steve, thank you for being here. Hello, Tyler. Nice to see you. You and your colleagues perform great services for our community. 
appreciate uh, appreciate your kind words, Steve. Uh, let's talk about an, again, an exciting upcoming event for four communities in Oakland County, for what are known as the Greater West Bloomfield Communities, West Bloomfield Township, but also the Tri Cities of Orchard Lake, Kingo Harbor, and Sylvan Lake. That's coming up this weekend. Can you tell us about? Uh, that event, what goes on at the Household Hazardous Waste event in West Bloomfield, and uh, give us a little bit of an origin story behind this event in West Bloomfield. This is our 14th year providing household hazardous waste services to our community, and the community, as you mentioned, includes Kegel Harbor, Orchard Lake, Sylvan Lake, and West Bloomfield. As you know, West Bloomfield residents tend to be much more environmentally sensitive and pro-environment than residents from other communities and there was an outcry in the around 2007 what do we do with our our hazardous materials our computers our televisions chemicals paint old medicine what do we do we don't want to place them in landfills sure. well, the township board then about 14 15 years ago devised the annual household hazardous day event but now it's not annual it's twice per year and it's timely that you and i are chatting because our first one for 2022 will be this saturday between nine and noon at town hall and also seniors that's age 62 or older can visit here both saturday nine to noon tyler and friday from four to six and, and so uh, what are some of the different household items that are accepted? There are a number of different venue, event, uh, vendors that are at this event at West Moonfield Town Hall that are able, able to collect and recycle or dispose safely of a number of different materials. What are some of the highlights of those? Important to note, if I may, that we also have shredding services twice per year. As you know, at originally and for 10 years, shredding services and household hazardous waste disposals would take place on the same day and same time. But now we've segregated the events. But in terms of items that the township accepts during the HHW event are paint, gas, oil, pesticides, fertilizer, fire extinguishers, insecticides, nail polish, smoke detectors, solvents, varnish, thermometers, light bulbs, batteries, kerosene, and some other items. Also electrical items, which would include cell phones, cable boxes, computers, DVD machines, VCR machines, printers, stereos, scanners, televisions, fax machines, laptops, and gaming units. And so, Steve, how did these different materials, um, how, how do these vendors, better yet, the, the, that you're bringing in to dispose of these materials, how has the township gone about uh, not only vetting these different organizations to make sure that they are capable of disposing of these items safely, but ultimately to build those partnerships to be able to have these different vendors provide these services to four communities on a twice annual basis? There's a company in Livonia called U.S. Environmental, and U.S. Environmental provides the staffing. I want to talk to you about volunteers in a moment, but the staffing. So when Tyler drives in in his vehicle, he ends up in an area where, for disposal, and there are individuals who are unloading these items from your car. You don't have to remove them. It's, it's done by the staff for U.S. Environmental. It, the company is extremely reliable, and a concern of everybody is, are these items really being handled properly or are they gonna end up in somebody's landfill? Because if they're in a landfill, why are we taking the time to, to deliver them to the township? So this company has had high ratings. Also volunteers. Yeah. We have approximately 14 of our employees on Saturday will be volunteering. Well, it's not pure volunteerism because they can receive a comp date, but they will be outside helping direct traffic, giving information to the motorists who are visiting HHW Day. More information on the West Bloomfield Township website, wbtownship.org. We're joined by Steve Kaplan, West Bloomfield Township Supervisor with us on the Oakland County Megacast. Uh, we've gone over some items that are accepted. Are there any items that are not accepted at the household hazardous waste events? Yes, good question. Air conditioners, ammunition, tires, car parts, helium tanks, hot water tanks, construction materials, plastic shopping bags, and styrofoam. Now we'll take medicine, but not controlled substances like Xanax and Valium, but those items are taken by our police department 
24 hours per day. Now you might wonder, and I know you're always a step ahead of me, Tyler, which is not difficult, but what about these items that you don't take? What happens to them? If you go to our website, our website under how to recycle solid waste, different agencies' names are there, different dump sites where you can take these items. Tires are always difficult for people because who wants to have old tires laying around the garage? Our experience is that if you have a relationship with Bell Tire or Firestone or some other tire company, that company might take the old tires off your hands. So uh, this this year's event has actually been expanded. In the past, it's only been a, a select couple of communities in the greater West Bloomfield area. Now it includes all four of the quote-unquote greater West Bloomfield communities, West Bloomfield, Keagle Harbor, Orchard Lake Village, and Sylvan Lake. Uh, where did that expansion come into play? Did it uh, Was that always there, or has this event expanded from just West Bloomfield Township out to neighboring communities over the years? Good question. Initially, it was West Bloomfield, but Orchard Lake, Sylvan Lake, and Kegel Harbor inquired, what about us? We're part of the community, and they are. So they pay us, I think it's $56 per vehicle. And so it's not free to those residents. It's, it's absorbed through the general fund at Kegel Harbor, Sylvan Lake, and Orchard Lake. The Household Hazardous Waste drop-off Saturday, 9 a.m. until noon at West Bloomfield Town Hall on Walnut Lake Road in West Bloomfield Township. Again, Saturday, April 9th, 9 a.m. until 12 noon is the Household Hazardous Waste drop-off. Seniors uh, have their drop-off day also available on Friday from 4 p.m. to 6 p.m. That's April 8th, 4 p.m. to 6 p.m. for seniors, or they can go during the general hours on Saturday, April 9th, 9 a.m. until 12 noon. More information on the West Bloomfield Township website wbtownship.org. We're joined by West Bloomfield Township Supervisor Steve Kaplan with us on the Oakland County Megacast. And while we're talking about environmental issues, uh, there was a bit of uh, controversy that popped up in the news recently here in West Bloomfield Township in regards to um, a development through, West, through a Henry Ford West Bloomfield Hospital um, an ongoing battle now between some an, an environmentalist group in West Bloomfield that's now speaking out about uh, their opposition to this particular to this particular development it went through all of its uh, basic legal proceedings within the township within the uh, planning commission and the environmental commission it was ultimately passed uh, and cleared to begin uh, do you care to give your thoughts on that situation and what the township is looking to do particularly the elected officials to prevent this kind of a back and forth after the fact in future cases well I think everybody in the township agrees we need a behavioral health hospital so those residents who are irate over the number of trees being removed in Henry Ford Hospital they're not saying you don't need that medical that behavioral health hospital so that's that's a given so what occurred it was like the perfect storm for one the planning commission interestingly or maybe not interestingly is the body that makes the decision on this land site use the township board does not ratify or verify or affirm what the planning commission has decided it might be, and one, one can't say what would have happened, but it might be that had the township board received an appeal or had the right to review or under the law made the ultimate decision itself, you would have had more trees saved. And, and, I, and I know how avid, fervent, ardent our residents are. They like the environment. Some people move here because of the environment. And the posi their position that more trees are being removed then might be necessary, it has, has good merit. And perhaps law needs to be changed. We're on issues involving site plans, land use, that the township makes the final decision or that the township automatically reviews it. And, and that's not the case here. So there might have been a different outcome. Certainly doesn't help people or satisfy people who are dissatisfied with the number of trees being removed at Henry Ford Hospital. And just for clarification for those out in the community that are following along with this story, is there anything that can be done at the township level at this point to modify those plans short of any back and forth discussions with the planners themselves uh, through Henry Ford Health? 
When the Planning Commission made, reached its decision, anyone in the community other than an elected township board member could have appealed. Nobody appealed to the township board. And as I said, who knows what the outcome would have been. But also it's not well known among the community and, and unless you're watching the Planning Commission meetings, you might not have known about the outcome. Well, therefore, you've asked what can be done now. We did meet with Henry Ford Hospital leaders and they did make some concessions Earlier on, they, they agreed to limit the building from three stories to two stories. Also, they have set aside 15.7 acres of trees permanently in a conservation document. And also, so we, we said to them, we, we're not happy with the outcome here. And although you have a finding by the Planning Commission, which we cannot reverse, what can you do? What they agreed to do, and again, it doesn't save any trees, is they're spending $800,000, Tyler, to have the behavioral hospital brought up to the highest certification in terms of environment and lead standards with the green roof. So that doesn't replace trees, but at least they made some efforts to alleviate, not alleviate, but to show good faith to the community. And the only thing that could have happened here now, Tyler, is if the hospital on its own decided to reconfigure the project and save more trees. And we've encouraged them to do that, but I'm not hopeful. More information on uh, these Planning Commission and Environmental Commission meetings that went over uh, this particular case that's been in the news of late is on wbtownship.org. We can re read all the minutes, all the agendas, all the agenda packets for each and every one of these cases. You can also watch all these meetings on demand at civiccentertv.com uh, where, where our p posts of these meetings will also have a link to the agenda so you can go over more information about the cases as well. We're joined by Steve Kaplan, West Bloomfield Township Supervisor on the Oakland County Megacast. Steve, a few more minutes with you today. Um, uh, exciting news as we uh, head into the warmer season that uh, an event that's that's pretty well appreciated in West Bloomfield Township particularly uh, those that are frequenting Town Hall is Food Truck Tuesdays that is back uh, coming up can you tell us about Food Truck Tuesdays and who can participate yes yeah, so the Township Board realized maybe five years ago it would be a nice way to enhance the community by having food trucks people like food trucks and we have food trucks now every other Tuesday at Town Hall between 11.30 and 1.30. And the trucks are parked near the library and, and Parks Commission building. And different vendors are involved. We have one vendor per event, but sometimes there's an ice cream truck stops by too. Everybody loves ice, ice cream trucks. We're joined by Steve Kaplan, West Bloomfield Township Supervisor. For more information on Food Truck Tuesdays in a couple places, wbtownship.org or wbparks.org, the two organizations. Uh, Parks, it's it's separate organization, and the West Bloomfield Township partner on Food Truck Tuesdays. More information on their websites, wbtownship.org and wbparks.org. Steve, any other upcoming events or uh, things in the township that our audience should be keeping an eye out for? Yes. We are sponsoring a Get Rid of the Garbage Day on a Saturday. Township employees are volunteering in no comp time mm -hmm. and maybe some residents in the community to remove the rubbish from the sides of the roads, the main street. Yeah. It's terrible. Who's responsible? The Road Commission is responsible for maintaining roads, but they have insufficient funding and staff to pick up garbage from the roads. Unfortunately, some people litter. You don't, I don't but some people even throw bags of garbage out the window. It's particularly bad on Drake, Drake Road on 14 Mile and 15 and Maple Road. So it's on our website, I don't have the exact date or just call Town Hall, but if you wanna to contribute to cleaning up the community, making those roads look better, which we all deserve because we are an environmentally sensitive community, give us a call, maybe you can join us for a few hours to help remove the garbage. Keep up to date on that effort and more at wbtownship.org. Steve, thank you for being with us. Thank you, Tyler. Good seeing you. To Sophia and Gabriel, even though these old knees can't follow on your adventure to the forest today, these flowers represent my love. These stitches and threads join us together. And wherever you see a flower, a bird, a beautiful tree, know that my love is with you.
Make the forest part of your story at a park near you. Find one at discovertheforest.org. Seventy-two point seven percent of high school students get less than the recommended seven to nine hours of sleep a night. This can cause pain, obesity, and can very negatively affect your mental health. When you have a consistent seven to nine hours of sleep every day, you get sick less often, lose more weight, and have better relationships with those around you. For more information about the dangers of sleep deprivation, go to sleepfoundation.org. This message is brought to you by the WBHS Digital Media Arts Program and 89.3 Lakes FM. Can I ask you a question? Why did you get your kids vaccinated? It was hard for them to social distance, to be isolated from their friends. I want them to get back to school and sports games. So as a pediatrician, I recommend the vaccine to everyone I know. The boys lost a former teammate and classmate who was only 20 years old. It's been a devastating year. We want to get back to normalcy. Our daughter is really looking forward to being with her friends, being a kid. Joining us now on the program is the Reverend Dr. Uh, Patrice Coleman Burns, Assistant Professor of uh, Professor Emerita of Nursing and Black Studies at the University of Michigan. Dr. Coleman Burns, thank you for being with us. Thank you for having me, and good morning to you, Tyler. Yeah, good morning to you as well. So recently, uh, at the last regular March meeting of the Oakland County Board of Commissioners. Uh, you are recognized as one of the notable women uh, for your, uh, in, in the county for your lifelong advocacy for freedom from all forms of oppression. Uh, first, congratulations on, on that honor from the Oakland County Board of, of Commissioners. What was your reaction when, you, when they told you that you were going to be honored by the board for your service in the community? Um, well, thank you for acknowledging their award for me. You know, my first reaction was, how did they know that I was doing all of this? You know, of course you send in the bio, but it's really important to understand and to respect the communities that we show up in, that people are looking and watching who we are and what we do. So my first response was, well, thank you. At first it came from Marcia Gershenson, who was of my old district, <laughs> and then, by uh, County Commissioner William Miller. So it was uh, quite a surprise and very well received by me. So uh, you were chosen for an award in part because of your lifelong advocacy uh, for freedom against all forms of oppression and violence. Can you talk about some of that advocacy work uh, that you've been a part of and what are any specific moments in your life that really drew you toward being an advocate for those that are facing oppression in our communities and beyond? There are so many. So I will turn 75 this year, which is a big milestone. So that means I have almost 50 years of advocacy. Um, when I started out, things like women's studies and Chicano uh, Barica studies and black studies didn't exist. And we created those. I started out at Wayne State University. And it was important because often we centered lives and views and perspectives that excluded so many of us. And so I began to do that work, starting out with violence against women and children, because in the days in which um, we started in the late 80s, it was sort of under the table. Folk did not mention it. It was a domestic issue. And to do that work to get the community involved, the police involved, uh, to rise to the occasion, not only of responding, but asking the question, where is this abuse coming from? Where is this hatred, this misogyny, this hatred of women coming from, and how do we address it? And so for 50 some years, I've been involved in that kind of work. More recently, maybe now about five years ago, moving to being on the board of Safe House in Washtenaw, and I'll, which was quite interesting to me because when I started out in the 80s, no one knew where the shelter was because it had to be underground, so to speak. And to move to to see the progress that it is a public space in Washington, safe house, and supported by the community. 
those are some examples of my advocacy um, in that regard. And certainly around black studies and women's studies. And now at the university, uh, women of color in the academy mm -hmm. and the work around diversity, equity, and inclusion. But please feel free to ask me and target on any areas that you would be interested in knowing about. Yeah, certainly we've had in the last couple of years uh, during the pandemic, certainly in the summer of 2020, a lot of these conversations, a lot of these discussions on oppression of certain populations, you mentioned uh, women, that, that, uh, but also the African-American community, uh, the communities of color, uh, especially in the last few years with different forms of violence in America and right here in the state of Michigan as well. Uh, as far as those conversation, conversations have come in the past decades and certainly in the past few years, there's still a lot of progress going forward and so that's why it's important to have advocates like you out in the community to speak up on these issues, but also and also to bring to light that these issues are far from being solved. So for you, what is your advice to those other advocates, to those to those young people that are also advocates for for freedom from all forms of oppression in our community, to have their voices heard and to also support those in the community that may be facing these forms of oppression today? Thanks for that question, Tyler. I think first and foremost mm -hmm. is to connect the dots. Many of your generation, and I'm making an assumption about what generation you're from, have no sense of the history and struggle that has proceeded to make sure that that history and that information is passed forward so that our young people understand the choices that have been made and therefore the challenges that now face us. The second is to absolutely be true to ourselves. We must show up as our authentic selves. So we say women and then African-Americans. Well, I am, as Sojourner Truth said, I am a black woman. The intersectionality of so many identities is important to look at and to, for us to work together. Number three, to make sure that voices that have historically been excluded um, marginalized, other are voices that are heard as we go forward. Why? Because we find that when we include more people with different values and cultures, same values, of course, that we seem to do better. When we listen to each other and we hear each other, we are enlarged individually and collectively because when we show up, and that we is inclusive of all of us, then we are a better people and a better society going forward. We're joined by Patrice, uh, by uh, the Reverend Dr. Patrice Coleman Burns from the University of Michigan, uh, Assistant Professor Emerita of Nursing and Black Studies, and recent awardee from the Oakland County Board of Commissioners, recognized as one of many notable women for her lifelong ad advocacy for freedom against all kinds of oppression. And, and so, uh, Dr. Coleman Burns, uh, as much as we've seen as we've seen progress in the past uh, few decades, as much as you've seen these conversations and, and these topics and the oppression of certain populations in, in American society and in global society reduce in some cases and, and change in other cases and sometimes in, bo in both ways over, over the, uh, your years of life experience and seeing what has also, been, what we're also experiencing in these current times, particularly on on the cases of race and, and on uh, gender equality as well, do you have hope for us in the in in the future that we will be eventually able to resolve some of these issues or find more productive ways to discuss these issues, to advocate for these populations, and ultimately to create a better world that is more equitable for all populations? Thank you. Uh, I have two responses to that. I'm a living proof that we have done better. Uh, I buried my the last of my father's and my mother's generation, my Aunt Cora, she was 96, and we buried her last week. But my father brought the whole family up from the South, the rural South, in the 40s, escaping lynchings, escaping oppression, coming to Detroit to build a better life. 
So number one, I'm a testimony that we have made progress. I live in a city now, historically, that was excluded Blacks and Jews. We are now, I'm living in a house that historically, because of redlining and racism, we can now, I can now live in. That's progress. The second thing is to understand that any oppression of me as a Black, African-American woman also dehumanizes all of us. We have to ask the question, how has the way and the oppression, the invalidation, the assaults, the insults, how has it hamp hampered the humanity of all of us? If race is a construct, if race is a construct, not only is blackness constructed, but so is whiteness. And what is that construct? And what do we need to do that we might show up and see each other in the integrity of who we are and the authenticity of who we are culturally and broadly? You know, when you look at, I, I look at the map of what's going on in Ukraine and all around Ukraine, there are various nations, Poland, Romania, Russia. These are nations that have rich historic cultures. And yet when we get to the United States, we want people to ignore and forget who they are and what values their grandparents brought. So my message and my hope for the future is that like I build up on the ancestors of those who come before me, that all of us will see the value of building up on that history, that ancestry, in order that we might be better than we started out being. So I have lots of hope. I've seen it happen. We're joined by Reverend Dr. Patricia Coleman Burns, a uh, University of Michigan Assistant Professor Emerita of Nursing and Black Studies, joining us on the Michigan Megacast. Uh, you've been, uh, for the past 30 years, a professor, an assistant professor of nursing and black studies. Uh, what drew you to the teaching profession, specifically drew you to college teaching, especially considering that these individuals that you would be teaching in, the, in these cases are so close to being leaders in our workforce and leaders in our community in the years to come? That is an excellent question. Um, I think about, you know how, and I am a religious person, how there's a burning inside of each of us, even you I would, and all of our audience members, and you have this drive and this thirst and you just can't shake it. And when I was a little girl, I would set up all my dolls in front of me and I would teach them. I would teach them because I love knowledge, I love information, I love the process of um, interrogating questions and thoughts and ideas. And so I came to the university first at Wayne State University um, in the beginning because I had something to share. I had a perspective and a rigor and a discipline that I thought would enlarge and empower young people to find out not who their parents wanted them to be, not who the world says, well, this is, you know, these are the, the um, degrees you need to have, but to find the core of who they are. Because when we show up in our own passion and our own gifts, we are a blessing not only to ourselves, but to the rest of the community and to the world. So I love teaching. I love to see young people find out who they are. And in all these years, I, I, I was looking back over Facebook, you know, you get to see some of those young people that you sold into 40 years ago, and they are doing well. It is a testimony of how we can, as a democratic society that includes and respects the diversity of all of us, that she uh, seeks to achieve equity, how we can be greater than we've ever been, or like Langston Hughes, be the America that we ought to be. Dr. Coleman Burns, as you converse with your students, as you, as you see the ways that their minds work, that they 
that, that, that they soak in the information that you're providing to them and the context of that information that you're providing to them and the connections between that information, whether it be in the nursing side, whether it be on the black studies side or in, in general life experience that you are sharing with them, how does that, how does that inform your future worldview and your ability to look at the future of our society and have that hope that you talked about earlier on in resolving or better, more productively mitigating some of these man-made issues such as, such as uh, equity and equality, uh, equality differences, such as oppression in our society? So number one, I show up in a space where I think students understand that I support and am true to my beliefs and my values. Therefore, they share with me a courage that generations before have not had. They are willing to be critical and to be inclusive, and they encourage me to, sh to show up and give the history and knowledge of what I've learned. So for example, you know, many of our students um, say they can walk into a classroom and know immediately if there's homophobia existing, that they will be excluded. Or if they are to not raise certain issues or if they're not, because those vibes are expressed in the classroom by our faculty. And they give me courage to call those things out, to listen to them, to work with students to figure out a way that they can be their authentic, authentic selves and create and be the leaders for the future that they know they are inheriting. And so what I find in the classroom is one, they're surprised in the first place that I am at all technologically um, literate um, because they see my gray hair and then they get concerned. But I listen to them and they keep me alive and I feed back into them. And one thing they know about Dr. Coleman Burns, they call me PCB, is that I will show up for them whenever I am needed by them, listening, hearing what they have to say. And in many cases, not only advocating in the community, in the grassroots community, but advocating for them in the classroom. And they know that I'll do that. Dr. Coleman Burns, earlier on, you had mentioned how your faith helps to inform your advocacy work, how it helps to inform your teaching work as well. For the past uh, 20 years, you've been a minister at the First African Methodist Ep uh, Episcopal Church of Farmington Hills. For the past three years, you've been serving as their senior pastor. What sort of fulfillment do you get out of that role in your church community, too, that, uh, that mirrors or is similar or parallels the satisfaction you get from your advocacy work and your teaching work? That is a great question. Uh, because of my faith, um, I know it's not about me. I know I'm not the center of the universe. Because of my faith, I get up each morning with the belief and the idea that um, the manifestation of the God that I serve is possible in all people. Let me say it another way. You know, I'm a, just a human being, a very frail, and because of my faith, I can have forgiveness. I can deal with any of my hurt or harm that I've experienced in my 74 years of living, and that I can see the love and possibility in all people whether they see it in themselves or not. And so it's been quite fulfilling to be in a community that respects the work of truth and reconciliation and honesty. And so I do indeed um, believe that it is this connection between who we are um, beyond our lives here in this space and the legacy that we can leave behind and the way in which we show and demonstrate love and build a beloved community. Dr. Coleman Burns, uh, before we let you go, anything else that you'd like to say today that we haven't talked about or any uh, lasting words of advice for those out in the community at this time? 
I think we're in a very dangerous period uh, where if we don't look and seek for knowledge and truth and listening, that we need to listen to people who are very different from us and hear and not come up with some predetermined um, platform that we can then become a beloved community. And that is what my wish and my vision is as we move forward. So thank you so much, Tyler, for your hosting and for your questions, very thoughtful, and for leading us in this discussion. You have a great day. You as well, thank you so much. Percent of high school students get less than the recommended seven to nine hours of sleep a night. This can cause pain, obesity, and can very negatively affect your mental health. When you have a consistent seven to nine hours of sleep every day, you get sick less often, lose more weight, and have better relationships with those around you. For more information about the dangers of sleep deprivation, go to sleepfoundation.org. This message is brought to you by the WBHS Digital Media Arts Program in 89.3 Lakes FM. Can I ask you a question? Why did you get your kids vaccinated? It was hard for them to social distance, to be isolated from their friends. I want them to get back to school and sports games. So as a pediatrician, I recommend the vaccine to everyone I know. The boys lost a former teammate and classmate who was only 20 years old. It's been a devastating year. We want to get back to normalcy. Our daughter is really looking forward to being with her friends, being a kid. It's the Great Lakes water. And so what people do ends up in our waterways. Flushable wipes are just evil. <laughs> they should be thrown away. They're impossible to destroy, and they can cause significant problems. One of the main things when you're cooking is to not dump fats, oils, and greases down your drain. They stick to the sides of pipes. They stick to everything they come in contact with. Don't put it down the sink. There's one water, and it's ours to protect. We've spoken to him multiple times before, and, and uh, in April, it'll be the two-year anniversary of his diagnosis with glioblastoma. We've previously talked to him about uh, some of his playwriting, which he's written uh, stage plays about uh, his experience with his diagnosis and some of the lessons he's learned uh, throughout his battle with glioblastoma. Joining us once again on the Oakland County Megacast is Eric Goldstein. Eric, thank you for being with us once again. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. Good to have you with us. Uh, so uh, it's been months since we've last had you in touch. How have you been holding up? Uh, how are you doing at this time? I'm having a good day and I'm having a good month. So I'll take it. All right. And so for those that uh, may not have seen your earlier appearances, can you tell our audience just what glioblastoma is? Glioblastoma is a type of brain cancer. It's one of the most aggressive types of brain cancer there is. If you're old enough to remember the Looney Tunes cartoons, it is uh, the Tasmanian devil of brain tumors, if you will. Um, we manage it very, very delicately and, and thoroughly. And, and uh, quite frankly, my being here today is an evidence of beating the odds. Uh, life expectancy is very short for this type of cancer. And talk about the various survival rates for those with glioblastoma and, um, and how that changes as each year passes. Right. Um, you know, there, there's, there's, there's these global statistical studies about overall survivability, um, and I don't have them memorized, but the basic idea is just about half of the people who are diagnosed with this um, die within a year, and about you know 70 to 80 percent die within two years. Once you get to the three-year mark, the the proportion of that original group that uh, lives through a given year starts to increase as compared to those who die. Um, so I'm looking forward to getting to that three-year mark. That's my optimism and that's my hope. And that's when the odds start to maybe become less severe. But at the end of five years, generally speaking, about five to 6% uh, of those who got it are still alive. 
We're joined by Eric Goldstein, who is uh, who is a, a playwright, also an attorney with the city of Livonia, and uh, we've had him on previously talking about his battle with glioblastoma, which he's written plays about uh, about his journey and about how it's changed his perspective on living, uh, even with a disease that for many has been deadly. Uh, one of the more important parts of your treatment has been Optune. Can you tell us about that particular treatment and, and what that has done for you? I'd be happy to. The Optune device, um, I'm not actually wearing it at the moment. We have to give my skin a break every few days to let it recover. You can see um, some red marks on my head. Um, it is affixed to my head with these giant Band-Aid-like things, and it, it projects an electric signal, an oscillating electric signal into the brain. It's called a tumor treatment field. And what that does is if it captures a tumor cell within the field, it'll prevent the tumor cell from dividing so that one cell doesn't become two. And that's basically how the tumors grow. If we're really lucky, it might even kill the cell that's trying to divide. So this is a non-invasive treatment. It does not involve taking chemo medication. You don't have the side effects of chemo. Um, it's not radiation. All of it is is an electric field, and uh, you just have to wear it all the time, except for giving your skin a break, which we're doing right now. It's just bad timing for you not to be able to see it, but good timing for my skin to recover. Yes, yes, good timing for your skin, definitely, and it's doing great work when it is, uh, when it is on your head. Uh, is this something that's relatively common in the treatment of glioblastoma, or, or is you, the use of this Optune device something relatively new or experimental? It's not experimental. It was approved for this specific treatment by the FDA, uh, I believe, eight or nine years ago. Um, it's expanding its use. They're expanding its use into other forms of cancer um, as the science evolves and, and, and demonstrates that it's possible. I'm not a full expert on it, but I understand they're looking into mesothelioma, a type of lung cancer uh, that involves asbestos exposure. Mm -hmm. I believe they're using it with uterine cancer, um, but I don't know if those are at the stages of being FDA approved or if it's still experimental. With, with the glioblastoma brain cancer, it has been shown to make a, a statistical improvement that you get a bump in your overall survivability. Um, it almost doubles your chances of making it five years. And, and so how long have you been using the Optune device? We started using it in July of 2020. Okay, so shortly after you were diagnosed, Right. You know, we, we discovered there was a tumor in April. We rushed to surgery, overcoming old COVID obstacles, which was very challenging, and, and got the surgery, and they, they pulled the tumor out. They did a pathology and discovered it was a glioblastoma tumor. They set me up for radiation and chemotherapy. And then when I had sufficiently recovered from that initial course, we started the Optum. That was by July. Just how common, to, to your knowledge and from the discussion with doctors, if this has come up, how common is of a treatment is this op, is Optune? Is, because uh, you started on a couple of years ago. I'm not sure when it was introduced after approval from the FDA uh, for treatment of glioblastoma, but it, it, uh, if it was only just a few years ago, it would still be a relatively new treatment. How common is this in treating glioblastoma? I expect it is increasingly common and routine for glioblastoma patients for whom it makes sense. There are uh, like large, large metropolitan centers where there's big hospital systems with specialized cancer treatment programs. They're going to be strong advocates for using Optum. If you're living out in the country or unless developed metropolitan areas where where the hospital is, is more equipped to dealing with um, non-oncology issues, non-cancer issues, um, there's gonna be less familiarity with Optum. And even if the hospital system just has a general oncologist, not one specializing in brain cancer, it may not be on their radar. Um, and if it is, they might even be skeptical of it.
We're joined by Eric Goldstein. He is a, uh, an attorney with the city of Livona, also a playwright. We've uh, talked to him previously about uh, a web production he did of of one of his plays, Here We Go, uh, in September of 2021. So it, when we talked to you then, you were in the middle of the production uh, of uh, of that play. Uh, it was done being done virtually because at the time we were still dealing with uh, COVID-19 cases. For those that uh, were not Tune in, tune in that day or have not heard of Here We Go, can you tell, give them a little bit of an overview of that production, of that story, and what your inspiration was behind producing that? Here We Go was prompted by a desire uh, to tell the story of having a regular life, being struck by cancer, this lightning strike, and then finding a way forward. and making the observation that I'm not different from other people. I just have a heads up that I'm going to be dying sooner than later and, and how that affects me. You might think it's a morbid, sad story, but it's really not. It's, it's a story about universals, about the meaning of life and what makes a life like a, a joyous thing. I put us in the context of history you know, and and and, and our ancestors and our, and our and our kids to come after us, and and I also have in it a, a very uplifting ending. What uh, I'd like to say more about is the feedback I've gotten from people who've watched. Here we go. It's on YouTube um, for free. Um, the glioblastoma patients from around the world have contacted me and told me how grateful they were to see me wearing the Optune device and that they felt less isolated. Um, and, and it gave them the vocabulary to talk about things they needed to talk about but didn't know how to. But more importantly for me, people without glioblastoma, people just having struggles in their lives, found this to be an inspirational story. It gave them hope, it gave them uh, uh, strength to persevere and overcome their challenges. And that was very fulfilling and satisfying for me to know that just telling my story was helpful to other people. We're joined by Eric Goldstein on the Oakland County Megacast playwright who wrote Here We Go, and, and that began uh, to be shown in September of 2021. We've talked to him previously. We're catching up with him now. Uh, lately, you've been spending these days uh, with others who have been diagnosed with glioblastoma uh, and helping them along their journey. Where did that start, and what sort of new um, inspiration have you taken from your experience uh, consulting with them on their ex on their journey and, and tailoring in your experience over these past two years uh, battling glioblastoma? Well, I've, I've found a number of, of there are, you know, we've, we, this is COVID, so it's not like there's a club or, or you can go to a support group that's tailored to glioblastoma. But online, I found I have found a listserv. I have found a number of of closed Facebook groups. Um, closed by meaning you have to apply or be invited in because you qualify. Um, there, there's there's glioblastoma Facebook groups. There's there's the uh, Optune users Facebook group. There's a caregivers Facebook group. I just learned about the other day. Um, I have been an active participant in a number of these groups um, as we try to all help each other. It's not like I'm a savior or anything. We are all just. Uh, peers dealing with similar things and trying to help each other and, and problem solve and troubleshoot. Have I answered your question? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. We're joined by Eric Goldstein. He is a playwright, also a uh, city attorney with the city of Livonia, joining us on the Oakland County Megacast. So at this time, uh, here we go, uh, has been showing for about six months uh, since its premiere on YouTube. And uh, any other works that you're doing uh, in theater at this time or any other writing that uh, or projects that you're working on that we should be on the lookout for? Well, we, we are, I, I, uh, I, I finished directing a play and it, it ran just a few months ago with the Rosedale Community Players. We had started it before COVID and before the cancer. And then as, 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 as the situation lightened up, uh, I think it was last September or so that we retook the rehearsal stage and we performed it. That was a lot of fun through the Rosedale Community Players in Southfield, Michigan. Um, 
No, there, I, I'm on the outlook for, for interesting and good projects. Um, you know, I've got a few things in the works, but you know, not, nothing that I, I'd like to, to tell you to be on the lookout for. It's, I think, too soon for that. For you, uh, has having the opportunity to be back out there and potentially go back to in-person theater or more regular interaction with the theater as you've been able to, as you were able to do pre-pandemic and, of course, pre-diagnosis, how does that help you in, in your personal recovery journey, going back and having that opportunity potentially to do something that you've enjoyed for a long time uh, that you also tailored into your initial recovery from glioblastoma? Well, one of the problems a lot of glioblastoma patients, particularly those who wear the Optune device, mm -hmm which is a very conspicuous thing. Sure. It, it brands you as being other, you know, on appearance. M many of us um, don't want to be others. We, we don't want to be the stranger or the weirdo. We are still who we are. We're just dealing with, with, with you know, a particular form of cancer, but we're still the same people we were beforehand. And um, what, what getting out and living my life as best as I can um, pushes back against that feeling of being other. Um, but at the same time, if I can just segue to another, the other side of that coin, sure. it, it can be often very discouraging recognizing that you're suffering from a life-shortening condition for which there's no cure. I mean, that's why I go in to get an MRI every 60 days. I mean, as great as Optune is, it's not perfect. And so we want to catch the signs of, of tumor growth as quickly as we can. And it makes no sense to go get an MRI every day. So somebody smart figured out 60 days is the right ratio on uh, some cost benefit analysis. Um, we do that because we're, you know, we want to catch the tumor if it starts to grow again. And um, the, 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 the specter of living like that, like, you know, if you're, if you're, if you're old enough, you remember Tarzan who would swing from vine to vine to vine. We're swinging from MRI to MRI to MRI. And it took me months to get past the idea that, yeah, I can think beyond 60 days. I, for a while, I didn't think beyond 60 days, but now I do um, with hope and optimism and, and, and Optune, yay Optune. But, but during, during, it's very, some, some people would say, some people would say, well, and live your life to the fullest, live every day to get the most out of it. And, you know, I disagree. That would be very exhausting, very exhausting. I would rather have a normal life than a, a life filled with sprinting adventures every day. Um, so how do you find a path or, or a metric that tells you what's a good day in, in, in this? And, and I would say, you know, with glioblastoma, and I'd say it would be the same kind of metrics to define what would be a good day regularly, and, and that's a personal choice. But for me, I've kind of narrowed it down to three things. Um, if I, at the end of the day, I can say yes to just one of these three questions, then it's a good day. And, 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 and I think anyone can, can use these three questions. It doesn't have to be a cancer patient. Um, have I been useful? Have I been creative? Have I learned something? If you can say yes to just one of those things, then you had a good day. And, and if you have good day after good day after good day, that's what you can call a meaningful life. Eric, thank you so much for joining us. Glad to be here. When times get dark, we can't see the help that's all around us. When you don't know where to turn, let 211 be your guiding light. One, one how can I help you? Our guides are ready to connect you with the help you need. For help 
with food, health care, mental health, and other resources. Call 211 or visit 211.org. 211. Get connected. Get help. We may come from different organizations, but we work together to protect the Huron River for everyone. Neighborhood storm drains carry water directly to local creeks and streams. No filters, no treatment. Storm drains also help reduce street flooding when it rains. So clearing storm drains and the areas nearby of trash and leaves helps keep them for rain only. It is easy to do your part by adopting a storm drain. Find a storm drain, check it, and clear it every month. So keep storm drains for rain only. There's one water, and it's ours to protect. If you are struggling to afford your internet bills during the pandemic, there's a temporary government program that may be able to help. It's called the Emergency Broadband Benefit, and it provides up to a $50 monthly discount on your broadband bill to qualifying households. Find more information about the program, including if you qualify and how to enroll at FCC.gov slash broadband benefit or call toll free at 833-511-0311. A public service announcement from 89.3. Lakes FM. Welcome back to the Michigan Megacast. I'm Tyler Keefe. To learn more about the program at civiccentertv.com slash megacast, where you'll also find information on our entire network of stations, including My Michigan TV, otherwise known as My My. Our next guest is the Vice President of Communications and External Relations at Gift of Life Michigan, one of 295 shared Detroit-supported charities and counting, uh, as well as nonprofits. Patrick Wells O'Brien joins us now on the Michigan Megacast. Patrick, thank you for being with us. Thank you for having me, Tyler. Appreciate having you on. So uh, first off, give us a little bit of an introduction to the background and the history of Gift of Life of Michigan. Uh, how, uh, who do you serve and what services do you provide? Well, thank you. Gift of Life Michigan is our state's federally designated organ and tissue procurement organization. So what that basically means is, is that from the moment of um, a donor being able to have the potential to be an organ donor, to when the transplant center performs that transplant, Gift of Life Michigan is responsible for that entire recovery process. We also are responsible for maintaining the Michigan Organ Donor Registry, and we do that in partnership with the Michigan Secretary of State. So when you go in and you renew your driver's license, they ask you, would you like to have your name added to the Michigan Organ Donor Registry? And we hope everybody in Michigan says yes, because when you do, that really provides the life-saving opportunity uh, to combat this list of 2,500 Michiganders waiting right now for a life-saving organ. Well, and people think about it too. They think about um, there's so many people in Michigan. They know that the organ donor registry can be done through the Secretary of State's office when you're renewing your license uh, or when you're updating your license or anytime, really. You can uh, join the Michigan Organ Donor Registry. And so they may think, right. well, there's tons of people in Michigan. There's probably plenty of organ donors that are in the registry. But what, what exactly is the need in Michigan for org organ donations at any given time? Well, and that is it. The need is great. And the, those 2,500 Michiganders are a part of a list of more than 100,000 people across the United States who are right now waiting for that life-saving organ. Um, one organ donor has the potential to save up to eight lives, heart, lungs, kidneys, two kidneys, two lungs, intestine, liver, pancreas, plus one donor can improve the life of up to 75 others, eye and cornea, tendons, skin for burn victims. Um, and people think that organ donation is something I'm, I'm too old or I'm too this or I'm too that. And we have, we have recovered life-saving gifts from people in their 90s. Um, so to that person on the waiting list, that person who's waiting for something, our own citizens in our own state, our own friends and neighbors, I, I, I'm sure all of your listeners know of someone who has at one point or another either benefited from an organ uh, or a tissue transplant. And, um, and there is no 
at this point in our you know in our technology there is no way other way uh for people to to survive um unless unless someone is generous enough to just simply say yes uh, when we have donor families talk about how meaningful it is for their love the tragedy of death and this provides this silver lining to say my loved one can provide the legacy of life for someone oh, i can't take my organs with me and why not help someone else so uh, i'm on the organ donor registry here in the state of michigan and there are many others who also uh, join me in the michigan organ donor registry who have done so through the secretary of state uh, when mm -hmm. they've renewed their license or through another process in which they're able to join the organ donor registry but many don't know exactly what the process is of your don of your organs actually being donated because in some cases the, there is tragedy that strikes and somebody right. dies and then their organs are donated maybe right there at the hospital they are uh, they're extracted and then put into the the registry but there are other cases as well where people die of natural causes and then their organs are, are then gone uh, into the registry. So how is that process then enacted? Someone's on the registry. What happens on the medical side of things when that person does pass away and their organs then go into the registry to be used to save those lives? Sure. So when you're on the registry, what you're doing is you're allowing your wishes to be an organ donor you're allowing it to be known and that uh, telling your family and friends is also a great way to make sure your wishes are known. And it's very rare for a death to result in the opportunity for organ uh, donation um, because you have to be in a very specific set of circumstances for the recovery to occur. And most of the time that means brain death and one, two percent of deaths um, qualify. You have to be on a ventilator and you have to be declared brain dead in order for the, but you're dead, but your vitals, vitals are still, organs are still being sustained in order for uh, donation to be possible. There is also a way uh, with a cardiac death. And if our team is right there, then it's possible for um, for the recovery of organs in those situations. Uh, with tissue, uh, we have the potential for many more donors than than in those circumstances. Uh, there's a longer period of time that we have the opportunity to recover those life-saving gifts. We're joined by Patrick Wells O'Brien, the Vice President of Communications and External Relations at Gift of Life of Michigan, one of 295 shared Detroit-supported charities and nonprofits. Uh, here on the Michigan Megacast. More information by visiting sharedetroit.org and searching Gift of Life Michigan to learn how you can support the organization and how you can get more information on the organ donor registry here in the state of Michigan. So what are some other things that people should know about the process of being on the registry and the process of organ donation? Because while it's an individual choice, ultimately that's going to be something that's going to be coordinated with the Michigan Organ Donor Registry as well as their family or, the, or their loved ones, whoever is there with them at the time of their death. Yeah, so if you are on the registry, then we work with your fam. We would work with the families to say we're on how we're on. We're going to go about the process of honoring that the family's wish, um, and we also work with donor families after a gift occurs to help them understand the um, the what happened with their loved ones' gifts? Did the is there a heart recipient? whose life was saved was uh, with their lungs or liver. Uh, and, and in some instances, those family members are interested in learning and meeting the recipient. And uh, we have very moving videos on our YouTube channel and on our website. And if you follow us on social media, uh, these heartwarming stories, we just had a story of Lauren who was a heart recipient and she just met her donor mom uh, um, uh, this past uh, couple of months ago, and we were able to record that meeting. And it was so touching to see uh, the mom put the stethoscope up to Lauren's chest to hear her, to hear her daughter's heartbeat again, and uh, and to know that her daughter um, uh, saved another person's life because of her wish to be an organ donor, uh, and she she said yes. Uh, and and put her name on the registry and every single Michigander can do that 
but only 58% of Michigan adults have done what you've done, Tyler, done what I've done and said yes to being on the registry. And other states do better. Other states are in 70% of their population, even greater who are on the registry. And that's been our biggest challenge. If we're gonna save lives and more lives in Michigan, we need more people to just simply say yes. It doesn't mean that anything is going to happen right now. Some people have misconceptions about what that means, that the medical emergency staff isn't gonna work as hard to save me, or uh, this is very different than being a living kidney donor. This, this happens in the rare instances of very particular circumstances of an unavoidable death. And in that circumstance, I would wanna know that I could be saving someone else's life. And that's the message we wanna get out there. All major religious denominations support organ and tissue donation and see it as the charitable thing to do to support your fellow human in, in, in having the opportunity to, to have life uh, through something that we can each do uh, and add our name to that registry. More information on their website, giftoflifemichigan.org. That's giftoflifemichigan.org. Or by visiting sheriffdetroit.org as well. We're joined by Patrick Wells O'Brien, the Vice President of Communications and External Relations with Gift of Life Michigan with us on the Michigan Megacast. So uh, can you talk about the Let's Talk initiative? What is that initiative? What is the goal of that out in the community to raise awareness through Gift of Life Michigan? That's right. So we have an outreach to multicultural community, to the public at large, to educate people about organ and tissue donation and talk about people's questions, talk about the people who talk with people who have benefited from organ and tissue donation and transplantation. And so we have a series called Let's Talk. It's live streamed on Facebook, and then it's uh, available on our YouTube channel to watch later or on our website. And some of the different programs have included uh, the organ donation process or talking with recipients. Uh, we've talked about how you can get more involved in Gift of Life Michigan. It's a designated great place to work and it's been a wonderful thing to get to know the people who do this every day uh, and some of the interesting stories that they have about what they've gone through in order to uh, save someone else's life. Uh, so there's stories like that on there. And, um, and also we talk with religious leaders and we debunk myths and we also talk about our legislative advocacy. So uh, we have about um, a minute or two left with you before we say goodbye, Patrick. Can you tell us just a little bit about uh, the Gift of Life's legislative advocacy and what are some things that you are advocating, your organization's advocating for uh, in the legislative front at this time? So we just were, uh, had a successful um, piece of legislation come through with Representative Felicia Brayback, uh, uh, sponsored a bipartisan bill and it's, it passed both houses of the Michigan legislature, that doesn't happen very often, and was signed into law by the governor to enable HIV positive organ donors to give to HIV positive recipients. And what that allows is prior to this, it was not allowable in the state of Michigan for that to happen. And uh, it's part of a federal effort and a federal act and for Michigan law to become compliant with that. We were able to get that, that passed prior to this we would recover HIV positive organs and we would have to send those organs out of the state of Michigan. And so everybody saw that this was a, a, a very necessary thing, even though the numbers are small for this, it's very meaningful, uh, especially if you're a person on the waiting list. Um, and people talk about the waiting list and it's, it's a waiting list, but there are so many factors that go into having you become matched for an organ donor that if someone who is HIV positive is able to receive some uh, gift from someone who is HIV positive. It makes uh, room for other people on the list who are waiting. Um, but none of this happens if people don't sign up and register. Patrick, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks. Appreciate it. Giftoflifemichigan.org for more information. We've been joined by Patrick Wells O'Brien, Vice President of Communications and External Relations at Gift of Life of Michigan, a shared Detroit supported charity and nonprofit. That is going to do it for this week's editions of the Michigan Megacast and the Oakland County Megacast. You can find all of today's interviews and our full episode on demand on civiccentertv.com slash megacast sometime mid to late afternoon. They're usually posted there. Big thank you to Patrick Wells O'Brien, Eric Goldstein, 
uh, uh, Dr. Pat Reverend Dr. Pat Patricia Coleman Burns from the University of Michigan, West Bloomfield Township Supervisor Steve Kaplan, and Chief Medical Officer uh, Dr. Russell Faust from the Oakland County Health Division for being on today's edition of the program. Again, all those episodes on civiccentertv.com slash megacast. Also, highly encourage you to go to our coronavirus page for up-to-date information from the CDC, the MDHHS, and the Oakland County Health Division on COVID-19 so you can stay up-to-date on everything you need to know about the spread of COVID, precautionary tactics such as masking and distancing, and vaccinations as well. Big thank you to our crew that makes this show possible each and every day. Calvin Brown, our technical director, with me in the studio for the full two-hour marathon that is the Oakland County and then the Michigan Megacast. Jared Clark out at the office of My Michigan TV, our Zoom producer, helping all of our guests navigate the technology behind this program. The king of television, Larry Nyland, our producer, booking all the guests, helping them and us get ready for informed conversations on a number of topics five days a week. And Maddie Mushkin out at Master Control, helping us on and off the air. On My Michigan TV, Steve Leto Live is next, followed by Larry and Maddie Live at 1 o'clock. We'll return Monday at 10 a.m.